January 9th, 2023 Public Work Session to order. Could we all please stand for the Pledge to the Flag? Welcome to everyone, including our guests this evening. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we have seven board members present this evening, and Mr. Snyder is on live stream this evening. Um, I hope everyone had a nice holiday season and everyone has a happy new year. And um, being that this now is a work session, I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Demensic. Thank you, Mrs. Schlegel. <clears throat> and once again, welcome to everyone to our board meeting and welcome to uh, as we approach the second half of the 22-23 school year. Uh, we have a number of things here that we're going to be talking about tonight. I just have some notes that I want to make here at the very beginning of the meeting. Before I forget, I want to make sure to mention that our meeting for next week is scheduled for Tuesday, January 17th. Make sure I get that right. So our meeting next week is not on Monday, it is on Tuesday. Monday is, we will be talking about that. We're asking on Tuesday for the ratification of Monday as a makeup school day. So that will be our first weather makeup day for this school year. That was for the day that we had back in December when we had some ice. School will be in session Monday, but the board meeting will be on Tuesday evening. So just wanna make sure that that point is clear. We do have, uh, our band and our winter band concert was held yesterday. Uh, our band continues to do an outstanding job with all of their performances, very proud of their efforts. And of course, our winter athletics season is underway. We've had some fantastic attendance at, at our events, which is great to see our community, our students, and people coming out to support our our athletes, that's very nice to see. And we also are still live streaming these events too under CCHS Today for members of the community. We've also found that that's great for family members that <clears throat> do not live in the area, that they can watch uh, our student athletes participate. I should also note that uh, today is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Uh, we certainly thank all of our officers here in the Cornwall Lebanon School District for everything that they do so it's also a special day for you too is that right officer warner yeah, yeah. it's his birthday yeah so happy birthday happy birthday so, yeah. yeah yeah that's it yep yeah another 39 there we go so and this month is also uh or this wednesday is maintenance and custodians recognition uh, day, so we will be doing some things here for them, but we also appreciate all of their efforts that they do, just the day-to-day -day operations. And they were busy over break, we had some cold weather, and with the campus and the buildings and just the issues that come up, uh, you know, they're in here all the time making sure things are ready to go when uh, it's time to get students back in school or for any of our other events as well. This Monday, of course, is also School Board Recognition Month and we will be having some recognitions next week on Tuesday at our general board meeting for our board directors. We do have, for tonight, we have some, some of the highlights of tonight's meeting is we'll be talking about very preliminary, our 23-24 estimated budget. We'll talk about some items there such as just personnel, we have some policy items. We're also going to revisit the Cornwall Borough land lease. Uh, Dr. Rackley's gonna talk a little bit about some the new science standards. We're going to begin our meeting with a recap of our November meeting with background and the processes leading up to our next three projects, our renovation projects here on the campus, the connector building, the high school and the middle school, these three separate projects. I'm going to do a brief recap of that prior to getting into the specific areas. And then Mrs. Hens is going to talk about how such projects are financed by districts and what specifically this means for Cornwall Lebanon. So that's where we're going to begin with tonight's meeting. 
And let's go ahead and get started then. <clears throat> Dr. Murray, if you want to go ahead with the presentations here. Okay. So back in November, we had, a, we had some lengthy presentations. We talked about these campus projects uh, and how we came to the recommendation, the conclusion to be looking at the connector building. And tonight what we want to do is do a brief recap and then an explanation of what, uh, what this entails with how these projects can be financed so it can be done in a way such as to not impact our programs uh, and done in a way that's responsible for the community. If you want to go ahead there, Dr. Murray. So as I mentioned, we have three projects, and these really are three separate projects. We talked about these in one meeting. However, they will be, they will be bid as three separate projects. We'll have separate awards that come in for the projects. We'll have separate contractors that may be working on it. It may be the same, but they are three distinctly separate projects. The connector building, the high school, and the middle school. A main part of this is needing to update a lot of our mechanical, our electrical, our plumbing systems in the buildings. And I know, Mrs. Hentz, we've talked about that. We have some, some issues that are ongoing right now. Is that correct? Yes, and chillers and boilers, trying to repair them. So don't be surprised if we come up with some type of solution for a piece of equipment that can no longer be repaired. Um, but we also have to make it through the next several years, depending on what building it is. We're going to look to manage that in the most efficient way possible if there are breakdowns, because one of the challenges is you replace a part here, but you have an aging system, and then perhaps the software that manages that is, up, is, is no longer functional. Those are some of the factors that lead into needing to do this renovation. Swing space and additional classrooms for the high school. So we have had for many years here at the high school, we've had uh, cases where there are teachers that don't have their own classroom. We have basement classrooms that are also here at the high school. Trying to provide that long-term space where we don't have to contend with that is a big part of this. But when we talk about swing space, that's where do the students go while the project is being completed? And so we also need to find a way to accommodate that. We have large groups of students, and we want to be able to minimize the disruption by having a place for them to go. So that's what we mean by swing space. Students go here, this section or this area of the building can be worked on. And we also need to consider our long-term needs, our enrollment, and our programs as well. If we go to the next slide, please. So the, <clears throat> this is a recap right here, and some of you remember this. Some of you lived through this, right, Mrs. Diefenbach? The last renovation here on the campus of the high school and middle school, it was substantially completed at the conclusion of the summer of 1996, and then there were some other work that was completed during the 96-97 school year. So that's been quite a while ago. Uh, we have been talking about this as one of our projects now for the last five, six, seven years, whenever we do the annual review and updates of our buildings and our facilities. <clears throat> we talked about this when we were looking at the Union Canal project, which we started and then we completed it, and the idea of having all of our buildings and all of our renovation projects on a cycle. You don't want to get into a position where you're doing all these things at the same time so that these are balanced in a rational way. So to that end, what we did do is we approved a facility study back in September of 21, which is a little over you know, a year, a year and a quarter ago with Beers and Hoffman to look at all of these issues within our, our buildings. We also had an enrollment comparison study, and this was presented to the board back on January 3rd, 2022, just about a year ago. However, uh, Mrs. Hens also updated those numbers just this last fall. It was October, November. October. And we found that they were not substantially different, but it did provide us a sense. We wanted to just get the most current data in there to see if there was any impact on what our projected enrollments would be. And then what we talked about was this connector building that was presented to the board on November 14th, 22. If you go to the next slide, please. 
And this is just a brief recap of our enrollment. It shows that it's, while we have some of these fluctuations, we have a large group of enrollment right now moving through Cedar Crest Middle School. It will be moving through Cedar Crest High School starting next year. We have some large classes. Our enrollment in the elementary schools is actually less this year than it was last year. So these come in waves uh, of enrollment, uh, but when we look at the long-term trends, this is where this is the best information of where we believe that we're going to be. And that's by level right there. You can see that those lines don't fluctuate too much. If we go to the next one right here, this is the overall trend, uh, which shows us with a net increase of, of probably a maximum of about 100 or so students over that nine, 10 year time frame. So that enrollment is really critical because that leads us to look at some of the decisions that we make relative to the different buildings or need for new buildings, capacity of our buildings, additions, et cetera. This slide right here shows the district owned buildings. I think the, the point that I'd really like to point out would be the, you have the, the building on the left, then you have the original construction, but the most recent renovation addition Ebenezer, which finished in that 96, 97 year. Uh, so that building is, is really one of our newest buildings. But the important point here is, is that when we look at these buildings, is that the high school, the middle school, uh, the district office, the campus here is next in that. But there also then has to be a planning because beyond that, we would be looking at Ebenezer and Cornwall to see what renovations would need to be completed there. Those would be the next steps beyond this 29 time frame. The point of that is simply that there's a, a plan to do these again so that we're not doing them all at the same time. But the law, if you postpone one too long, then obviously that can, that can create a lot of other problems and challenges in itself. If we could go to the next slide, please. So just a little recap. When we looked at this facility study, there were several options that were considered and then there were also considerations. One of these options was the construction of a new two grade level building, which would have been in the field property across the farm across from the main campus. I mentioned last time in November, probably a five, six building. That was one option that was considered. The other option is the use of temporary classrooms, many of which would be just outside, probably in the high school renovation, right outside here in the parking lot. But it would be an awful lot of them. And then the other option was the construction of the connector building for flexible use. Some of the factors we looked at were the overall cost, what was needed based on enrollment, what's the cost of what's being spent, what's is versus per, what's is, will be permanent, meaning that trailers and the need to expend other dollars, is that really for temporary classrooms the most effective way? And that's not even including the disruption that creates for, for education. So the impact on learning during each project. And then what, what can this space be used for in the future? So if we go to the next slide, this slide just shows the three different options that we talked about back in November. One was that potential five, six building that's at the bottom of the screen right there. Uh, that's a building that would house somewhere from eight to 900 students at the, the size that it's relative to that map right there. If you look to the upper end of that, you could see up there in the blue, that's where if we were to have temporary classrooms in the high school, that's an example of the amount of space that that would take up. Of course, there's a whole slew of other problems with that. The loss of parking, all the uh, mechanicals, the temporary hookups that you have to have as well. And then in the blue in between the middle school and the high school was the connector building. So what we talked about was looking at the cost of these three different options and looking at the long-term use, looking at the flexibility of space, looking at what our enrollment needs are. The, the most rational choice seemed to be that building of the connector building. Uh, and if we go to here, these are some slides from that. This is a two-story <coughs> building uh, that was presented by Beers and Hoffman at our November meeting. Uh, we talked about the second floor having 11 classrooms on it. The first floor, I think that's, is this the first floor that a second floor slide uh, would also have that. But this space would also be convertible. It could be used as classroom space. It could be used as office space in the future, but it would create options. It would connect on the second floor at the high school, the first level at the middle school. And then we have some other slides that's potential uses, office space, 
uh, and pictures of what that would potentially look like. You can move through some of these here, Dr. Murray. Thank you. So when we looked at this, we have to be careful to define this because these are distinctly different projects. But they all have to happen sort of in harmony with each other, meaning that we know that we're going to need to do something to the high school and the middle school here. So delaying that creates other problems where you know, we could end up in a temporary classroom situation, not have swing space available, and be making short-term decisions that aren't really in the best interests of the district or the most responsible use of, of resources. So in looking at this, that's why we recommended the connector building, because that creates that swing space, that creates some of the additional classrooms, that creates the flexibility for the long term, and it does so in the most efficient manner possible. So that's project one. The completion of that then allows for project two, because the swing space is created, which would be the high school. That we have that space then to use for classrooms while certain sections of the high school are being renovated. And then three would be the middle school. You see how those lines overlap because the first yellow line is the design and development phase. And you can see that if you, if you shrink that a little bit there, Dr. Murray, that's screen. Once we complete the design and development phase and we move into the actual project, we'll then be in the design and development phase for the high school while that construction is taking place. So these, these will work that way in terms of planning in order to keep this on schedule. If we go to the next slide. This shows here another way of depicting this, uh, the three projects. Project one, and this shows the construction time frames roughly uh, from the spring of 24 to uh, summer 25 for the connector building. And then for the high school, the renovation being that two-year period from 25 to 27, and then the middle school 27 to 29. You can see that there are, there are different estimates there. When we get into the high school and the middle school, there are so many decisions that need to be made and so many variables to that. That's why it's difficult to pin that down, but they gave us some very, very big estimates. For the connector building, that's closer. That's probably a more accurate range uh, that is being recommended and looked at at this time. So those are the three projects that we're looking at. One of the things that we said we wanted to talk about then was how, how are such projects financed? How does this work? How does this fit into our overall budget? And how do districts and how do public entities and municipalities, how do they, how do they manage and finance such projects? So, the next part of this presentation, Mrs. Hens is going to take and, and do an explanation of that. Okay, thank you. All right, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about are the different ways for uh, school districts to fund projects. So um, the smaller projects, obviously we can fund them in the operating budget or we can use capital reserve funds um, for those smaller projects. When you're talking about the larger projects, um, part of the, the most important thing is the plan. Um, as Dr. Demensic mentioned, that we have a plan, we have a cycle of when we're gonna hit each building. Um, so they're not all done at once. So one of the things when you're planning is to possibly set up a signed fund balance. We do have a campus assigned fund balance in place right now for part of that long-term plan. Um, and local governments, school districts also use bonds, uh, municipal bonds, as well as bank loans. And then you can also look at grants if they're available, as well as donations or fundraisers. So m most common is your local government bonds. Characteristics of the municipal um, debt is um, Typical, you're issuing it either for new money to fund a project or you're issuing these uh, municipal debt for refinancing purposes. Um, but in order to issue bonds, you have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason to issue the bonds. Um, it can be fixed, it can be variable rates. Doesn't, um, either way, you can choose. It depends on what the, the rates are. Um, 
Cornwall Lebanon uses PFM uh, financial advisors to issue their bonds. Um, bonds are typically, uh, they have a maximum of 30 years. It could be 10 to 30 years. Um, and then um, issue, the issuance is a general obligation pledge. So it could be full faith, credit. Uh, so there's different options there. And then um, the school district themselves, they actually issue the bonds. So the type of debt that you can issue would be um, either a public bond issue or a private bank loan. So Cornwall 11 has done both. And then also what is a municipal bond? Municipal bonds, you can kind of relate them to a mortgage. So um, there are uh, issuing costs to it, just like a mortgage. Um, you, again, you can do a, a a borrowing from 20 to 30 years, you can do 10 years. Um, again, uh, mortgages have fixed or variable rate. You can choose it depending on what the rate is, what makes sense at that time. So that is a little overview about what a bond is. Um, and then your investors are those that want to invest in municipal securities. So you're pretty much selling a bond and loaning it from an investor. So currently, our district has um, a net of $13.5 million in debt. Um, that makes that, that is three um, different general obligation bonds or, or notes. So right now, we have a 2014 general obligation bond issue. Um, right now, it is scheduled to uh, drop off, or our last payment is scheduled in 22-23 this year. We also have a 2020 general obligation bank note, which we had issued through a bank. Um, we had issued that to refinance um, because the rates were lower than what we had. And that is planning on to, uh, the last payment for that is 2324. And then um, also our 2017 general obligation bond issuance, that was issued to fund Union Canal. So that is um, uh, the last payment would, are scheduled for 2627. The 2014 and the 2020 um, debt, those are both refinances from previous projects. So again, like I had mentioned, it has, there has to be a reason for the issuance, whether it's a refi or um, an actual project funding. So um, based on that information, right now, this is our debt schedule. Um, these are the payments that are due each, each year um, based on that debt that's outstanding. And as you'll see in 27-28, there are no payments due at this time if no bonds or loans would be issued after that year. So right now in our budget, we have a $95 million budget estimated for 23-24. The orange piece at the top of the screen is is a, a part where it allocates the debt payments and also budgetary reserve. Um, that is where our debt payments are, we, we kind of reserve a certain amount for those debt payments. And you're familiar with that pie chart, I do use that a lot for our budget. So if you go on to the next slide, um, just to make it simpler, um, there are, five pieces to our budget, mainly personnel. Most of our budget is made up of personnel. Then you also have purchase services that our personnel do, don't provide. And then also supplies and equipment, and then the debt payments is what we're talking about tonight. And then budgetary reserve. So debt payment estimated for next year in the 23-24 budget, we have allocated or reserved $5.5 million. if you wanna to go to the next slide. So for um, this project, we, like Dr. Demensic mentioned, you have to plan ahead um, to uh, make sure that we have the right funding and we're not doing projects at the same time. Um, funding for this campus, we are going to use um, campus, to find, campus assigned fund balance as well as issuing new bonds or loans depending on what is the best rate 
at the time. So we do have three projects going on. Um, there are a lot of variables that will happen over the next several years. Um, so we will have to use PFM financial advisors to provide us with recommendations on what the best route is, whether it is a bond, whether it is a loan, and it, all based on the rates is whether we take out three bonds, one for each project or multiple bonds. And again, it all depends on the rates. Um, one of the other funding sources that we used to have is the state funding um, was a subsidy called Plan Con. It was planning and construction reimbursement. Um, with the, the current debt that we have, if you notice I said net $13.5 million that's outstanding right now. As a part of that, we are expecting about $2.5 million from the state to help us offset those bond costs. Um, we can no longer rely on that because it's in a moratorium right now. We have no idea if it's ever going to come back into play. But that is a decent amount of money that we will not receive um, to subsidize these projects. So those, that's a part of the planning. We've got to make sure that we know what we're going to get from the state. Does, does everybody remember that, this whole discussion? Because it sounds, people mention, oh, plan con is there's a moratorium on it at the state level. And what does that mean? Well, what that means is that the districts don't get that portion of any construction project subsidized by the state funding. And that's been how, how many years now has the state done that? Are we three years in? It's, it's longer than that. Longer it's than probably that. five years. Five years six now. Six years. I believe so, Mr. Phillips was here at yeah. the time when they placed the moratorium on. So right now, the state, um, they do have a line item called Plan Con in their budget, but it's um, for those that they had promised already, those that were already in the works of a project. So any new ones after that moratorium went into play, you cannot apply for subsidy for that. And it's a significant amount of money. So that's another piece that you have to look to see if there's any type of subsidy. Um, but as of right now, based on our planning, we are planning that there is no support from the state. What you also have to do is um, constantly watch that schedule of debt like I had shared with you, the amount that um, we are to pay each physical year and line it up with the new bonds. So one of the things that PFM does for us is based on our existing debt and also what we need to be able to provide to a project, they, they look at that schedule every year and make sure that it lines up, that we have the 5.5 million that I talked about to cover the payments. Um, and also then what you want to do is increase the budget allocation based on those payments, based on that schedule to make sure that what is in the budget, like that $5.5 million, covers the amount that, of payment that's due each year. And you want to plan, it, it's, it's a long-term plan to make sure that it also includes projects that are coming up, such as Ebenezer, such as Cornwall. So you also have to consider those. So then that helps you maintain a consistent budget to budget. There's not a huge hit to it. And then you slowly increase it to what your needs are in the future. And it also allows to um, fund, it provides you with funds for planned and unplanned projects. So uh, let's move to the next slide. So I'm going to provide an example. Um, and again, since this is over the next six years, this is going to happen, I wanted to provide an example. It's not necessarily what's going to happen, but at least you have an understanding of how we would go about um, the smoothing of debt to make sure that there isn't like one hiccup um, over the next several years. So in this example, we are considering the three projects that Dr. Demensic talked about. Also in the example um, that I have, the budget for the debt that um, is due, it will meet the, the demand or the payments due in 2039, 2040. That's hard to say. Um, but again, in this example, um, the amount that I have allocated in the budget versus the, the payments that are due, it will meet that and cover that full. 
So in the meantime, we will use assigned fund balance to cover those uh, portions. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, we'll go over this example. And column one is the school year that the payments um, we're talking about. And that, that service column is the amount that I am going to have in the budget specifically for debt service. That little piece of the pie um, is what we're talking about right now. So what I am looking at doing is increasing it slow, slowly every year to eventually meet the demand of all three projects. Budget increase for the debt service for each specific school year or fiscal year is listed up there. I'm planning on increasing it by 100,000. Um, very small amount in that small piece of the budget. And that's, again, part of planning. Um, equivalent uh, tax increase for that would be, as, as you see on the screen, um, the 23-24 is it's an equivalent to a 1% tax increase at this time. And then if you look over all of them, over the next six years, a total amount of increase would be equivalent to a 2.5% increase. But again, that's spread out over six years. And now, and, just, to, just to pause on this for a minute, because I know this is something that we hear questions about, is, is that you know, a project like this the taxes are going to increase five, ten percent, and these, t and and it's not accurate. And that's why I think it's good to point out that this doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lot of variables that go into a budget. Mm -hmm. This just shows the equivalent amount of dollars that are set aside that it would need to increase. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's there are other factors, many other factors that go into whenever a real estate tax is set for the year state subsidies, all those types of things, cost of health care, cost of all these other big variables. But this just shows what it is equivalent to Correct. in terms of an increase, just to try to give it perspective. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, with this? yes. Um, now, again, um, I would love to have that debt service drop off and not have to worry about that. But to be too responsible and maintain these buildings, we have to go this route. Um, and make sure that our buildings are up to date. I think that's it. I think the next slide. Yes. So in order to move forward um, with this, the, the connector building project, um, we're going to ask for your approval to uh, approve Beers and Hoffman as the architect next Tuesday night. Um, and it also approve a construction man manager, Fidavia. Now, the approval on the architect, it does, it is specifically for the uh, building connector project only. And then the propo proposal under the architect also includes your civil engineer um, as well as uh, several other engineers. So they, they uh, maintain those engineers, those vendors. And then the construction manager, Fidavia, is providing pro proposal for each of the projects. That makes sense? Does anybody have any questions on those? You know, let's just pause here after this. That was a lot of information and just, if there's any questions? Well, I, I, I did not look at the, at the audit, <laughs> but in the audit, all those set aside funds are accounted for and the auditors say, check, this is good, this is mm -hmm. good, this is good. So we're all above board with everything we're doing. And also, how long have we had PFM? Oh, gosh. Um, they were here even before. Mr. Her. Phillips used, okay. used them. I think and Mr. Aki used them. Mr. Aki, okay. so they're very reliable. They're very, very reliable. You consult with them once a year or frequently? Oh, more frequently More frequently. Than that. <laughs> yes. Good. Good. So, yeah. so when you look at some of the refinances that we've done here, that's because of that consultation, because there was the opportunity back to get better rates. That's why those were done, because that's And that that's saved. one of the reasons why we have a 2020 bank yeah. note, is right. because they reach out to us. They keep their finger on the pulse yeah. of yes. what's going on and, right. and advise you. Excellent. Thank you. Other questions, input, <coughs> comments from, from anyone on the board? Yeah, I'm a little confused, which is easily done. Uh, for the, the, the debt services, 
budget, the 22-23, you have 5.0 million. And you are putting in there 50,000. <clears> next year, it's 5.5 million. And you're putting in there next year, it's 550,000. That 5.5 million to 5.6 each year it goes up. That's the money we're using to pay for this connector and the school renovations and all that, correct? It's going to cover both the existing out debt that we have as well as it'll slowly smooth in the connector building. Yes. As well as so so that's going to be our whole debt services yes. monies to pay for all of our debt service, correct. whether it's the connector, the high school, the middle school, or what's existingly we have in debt. Yes. Is that yes. correct? That okay. is correct. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good yeah. capsule. Yep. That's a good question. Yeah, thank you for that clarification there. Another question. I, um, Beers and Hoffman, we're going to approve them Tuesday night for the connector building design only, correct? It, it's, uh, there's other services as well besides yes. the design, yeah, well, but, but yes. it's, it's basically whatever the three engineers or whatever for yes. the connector building only. Yes. Correct. Okay. And then when we do the high school, we'll have to approve another engineer Correct. architect to do that. And yes. vice, so same with the middle school. So we'll yes. have to get, do this three times, so to speak. Correct. But as far as the construction manager, we're approving him for all three right now. Correct? As of right now, yes. Okay. There is a, um, there a is a, a, yeah. A, yeah, a clause in there. I was trying to think of the word. <laughs> there is a clause, clause in there that it, between any um, project, if we would like to say, you know, to move to a different construction manager, we have that capability. Yeah, yeah. There, so there is an out that yes, for that work. Correct. To get out of their contract if we feel that they're not doing. Yep, we specifically put that work in or place. whatever. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Benson, I have a question. Um, just curious, what? Why did we approve or the proposal for the three projects for the construction manager? That's how he presented it, and the amounts that um, the percentage that it comes out to based on each project is very reasonable. Okay. And I'd like to lock him in. Lock that in. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And speaking as the wife of a former construction manager person, <laughs> it is helpful to have one overseer on all the projects, if possible. If not, then fine. Because of the different elements that right. go together so with this, that yeah. 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 It's a lot of little things. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. I did look at the price, though, and, and I'm just going to speak of the the high school right here. That's a big difference mm -hmm. between the high and the low. Is there a was there a reason for, the range? for that? Yeah, I mean, you're talking thirty, almost thirty thousand, thirty million dollar difference. Yeah. Where everybody else is, every the, the connectors, two million dollars difference, and the the middle schools roughly um, seventeen thousand, seventeen million. I'm sorry, difference. Why is the big difference between the high school, the high and low? Do you know, or do we? I, here's what we know is this much: is the couple factors. One is, is that some of this will be dependent upon material cost, labor costs that are further out. So they provided a range that tries to accommodate that. It will also be involved in terms of what, what are we looking at once we really dig into the buildings. Are there some areas and some rooms that are not going to need a lot of changes when we do the design and development phase, or are there other places where we're looking at significant pieces? Because we haven't really dug into that, that level of detail yet, that's why it's difficult to pin that number down. And that's where, too, I know I've shared with some of you and some other people is that that's where the decision-making process comes in, too. You know, there's a lot of things that I know that I hear from staff and I know that everybody would like to have, and, and I certainly would, too, but we also have to say what's, what's practical within where the total project comes in and look at what, is the, what are the best options given the resources that we can allocate. So that's why those ranges are so big. And it's really going to be when we get down into the detail level of the project, say, okay, 
this room, we're not going to do a whole lot. Maybe we're going to change lights in this particular room. Maybe we're going to update flooring. But in this room here, you know, we get into some of the plumbing. We look at restrooms, and we start talking about updating things for ADA requirements. If we start talking about updating any classrooms that have uh, water or any type of plumbing issues in them, that's where we're going to run into some costs, moving walls. Large one, of, one of the challenges yeah. that Mr. Sakala had from Fedavia is like, he can go by what, what he knows now, the cost. And one of his goals is to make sure that in the end, he can say, yes, we were in that range. He never wants to be outside of that range. I, I understand that, and I appreciate your explanation, but it's still it, it kind it's of, a lot of money. The, the project number two is a $30 million mm -hmm. difference, where one is $2 million, and I understand the cost of things. And number three, which is further out, is only $17 million difference. Mm -hmm. Is it because the high school has more room, more space, yeah. more electricals, yeah. you know? There's a is, lot more. This building is, is significantly yeah. larger than, this building is significantly larger than the middle school. There's a lot more variability. And we're going to have to meet with certainly with the architects, with the engineers, have input from the staff, uh, look at what some of the long-term needs are going to be for this building to really narrow that down. But that's why that's in there. And I think when they gave us those numbers, Mr. Zug, I think they don't, again, like Mrs. Hens said, they don't want to say one number and then have it come in higher. No, I understand I that. There's I just, some of that, too. You know, I just saw that the, that was, the high school was the biggest, and yeah. I just wanted to get a clarification. I mean, obviously, our goal is going to be to stay towards the lower end of that. Right? That's what we're going to try to do. Yes. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we, we don't do things uh, on the inexpensive side that cost us later. Yeah. yeah. And we made some decisions like that over at Union Canal where the quality of roofing that we put on, we... You know, we could have gone with a less expensive option, but it, that wouldn't have been the right thing to do. We made some decisions there to say we upgraded the, the thickness of that roof quality, you know. And that was a good decision because it costs a little more now, but in the long run, it, it, it saves you more later. So those are the kind of things that we'll get into. I think it's also important to point out that the programs at the high school are significantly more expensive to run and the equipment. The equipment, much so. Like the FFA and, I mean, there's a... A lot of programs. When you look at the equipment that we have back in our, in our ag and in our tech area, you're right. That's significantly more expensive than what we would have on a middle school. Right. And, and even, too, just the, uh, the open spaces, the size of the auditorium, the gyms, the weight, the pool. How, how big is the auditorium going to be again? <laughs> Not quite the biggest. In the how big do you want this number to be, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> those are the... That's where some of that, that discussion comes in, you know, things like the planetarium. We, have, we do have a lot of those things here that, to be upgraded, are going to make that much more expensive. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that input. And so for next week, then, we would have motions on to approve the hiring of the architects as well as the construction manager, which would then Correct. begin the design and development phase for the project one, which is the connector building. Yes. And that would be the that would be the starting point for this. Okay. All right. Let's go on to buildings and grounds as our next item. And Mrs. Hens, if you want to take these items here. Okay, so um, I have a couple of projects that I want to talk about, and these are smaller projects, so these are in the operating budget. Um, we need a revision to two of the projects, to Corma Elementary Playground Equipment Replacement. Um, we need, uh, the, the main unit is being purchased, but we're also including um, installation and grounds material. Uh, so this is co-star pricing at 126.60. So we'll have this on for your approval next Tuesday to do the revised invoice. Ebenezer Elementary is also getting a piece of equipment replaced. Uh, this is also including uh, grounds material and installation. 
Um, this is also going through CoStar's pricing and the total there is 101.190. And we'll be asking for your approval. Both of those uh, proposals are in board docs for you to review. That's all I have for buildings and grounds tonight. Okay, any questions about those items? Okay, I will go on to community relations curriculum and staff development. Uh, Dr. Bosman, I think you have the first two items. Dr. Rackley, then you have the third item under this section. So go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Back in November, we had our parent-teacher conferences for kindergarten through eighth, so these are just some uh, participation uh, for those conferences. The one thing I'll just say is, as you look at the numbers up there, uh, you'll notice that the number of conferences exceeds the number of students, and that's because there are students whose parents uh, or guardians met with more than one individual while they were here for conferences. So. Uh, just to give you, you can see there, then there are multiple uh, families who saw more than one staff member during the conferences. So uh, those were the ones that were back just before Thanksgiving. It's good participation. Yeah. Glad, to see our, yeah. glad to see our parents. And most of these were in-person conferences too. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Dr. Yes. Bosman? Yeah, the majority were in-person. In but we had virtual options for families if they, if they preferred that, which... Some, for some people, it works. Just some because some may have requested schedules. that, and that was an option for families. Okay. Very good. Next, uh, in board docs, you'll see a list of students there that will be participating in a mid-year uh, ceremony that will take place on Friday, January 20th at the high school. Uh, the students here, I'll just... Read off the names, we have Lindsay Baumgartner, John Valsetta, Kara Heckard, Blaine Heisey, Allison Hess, Kaylee Kirshner, Gwen Kipp, Caitlin Reese, Erica Scogno, Deanna Sellers, Connor Shawley, Sophia Tanner, Alyssa Weaver, and Colby Willis will all be participating in that mid-year um, recognition, their early graduation. Now we've typically done that right here on the high school LGI. I know that Mrs. Schlegel has participated uh, in that. We've done it. It's a nice brief but recognition for those students that are graduating mid-year. Certainly any of you are welcome to attend. These students are still eligible to walk and participate at our end of year commencement, but sometimes that doesn't always work out with their schedules depending upon what their lives and what's happening. So we offer this, our high school has done a great job our counseling department, our administration here in arranging this for these students in addition to that. It's a, it's a very nice, nice event. I'm very proud of them. So again, something that we started doing probably four or five years ago. Uh, participation is varied. I think last year we had one. This is our largest group. This is our largest group. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome back. Um, tonight I get to share with you just a little bit about the new science standards that were rolled out by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, they were approved in July, but they were posted for us um, to actually dig into um, in November. So we've had an opportunity to at least give them a quick cursory glance. They go into effect of July 1 of 2025. So these new standards are very different than the standards we've seen in the past. Um, they're they're being referred to as the STEELS. So if you hear that acronym out there, you'll, you'll understand what that means. It's science, technology, and engineering, and environmental literacy and sustainability. And so that's really the acronym that they're using to encompass um, all the components of science. These standards are broken into what they're calling three-dimensional learning, looking at science and engineering practices, like what things do scientists and engineers do when they're solving a problem, building a model, rethinking or designing something. Um, the disciplinary core ideas are broken into four areas of science, physical science, earth and space science, the life sciences, and then engineering technology, and then other areas of science. And the cross-cutting cross -cutting concepts are those things that apply across all areas of science. So how can you apply something in life science to 
earth and space science, or how does something in physical science apply to technology or some other aspect of science. The real focus of these standards, though, is learning through inquiry, authentic exploration, problem solving, and critical thinking. And the focus is really on the process more than the content. So the process of learning, how do we learn? What do we gain? How can we fail forward? How can we make mistakes and learn from them? And so it's in that authentic learning process. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, just as a quick, um, some quick notes as to how this applies to Cornwall Lebanon. Like I had said, the, the standards do go into effect on July 1 of 2025, which means the first time the steels will be assessed will be in the 25-26 school year. Um, at a conference earlier in December, they told us that the assessment anchors and eligible content for what students will be assessed on are probably <coughs> about a year out. So we're maybe hoping to see them next summer. And then for us in Cornwall, Lebanon, you know that we have our five-year curriculum cycle. Science was purposefully moved backwards so that they would hit curriculum year one, which is the writing year, this coming school year. So in the 23-24 school year, our science department will be in that writing cycle and have something um, for you in May of 2024 for board approval. Um, we're currently looking at um, professional development sessions and looking at ways, different ways we can support our science team and our curriculum leaders as they prepare to address these new standards and, and start that writing process in July. Okay. Good. Do we, do we know how this, uh, the new standards are going to affect our PSSAs and um, the biology exam for science? Yeah, so uh, we don't yet just because we're still waiting on those assessment anchors and eligible content, but I think um, a couple things we know is that our current um, biology curriculum is outstanding and our students do so well on our Keystone exams here at the, at the high school in biology specifically. So I think that hopefully when we see these assessment anchors and the eligible content come out, they're going to align closely with what we do or be something that we're going to be able to, to quickly integrate and move toward. Um, and then I think there's going to be some question about what happens in um, the elementary and middle school PSSA and what that looks like and what kinds of things we're going to have to change or adapt to um, to meet those changes as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions about any of the other items that we have or that item under community relations, curriculum, and staff development? Okay, thank you, Dr. Bosman, Dr. Rackley. We'll go on to extracurricular. Mrs. Hentz, we have a few items here. Yes, we do. Uh, overnight field trips, we have two, the Cedar Crest High School students to Erie, Pennsylvania, for Thursday, March the 16th, 2023, to Saturday, March 18th, 2023, for bowling state championships. Um, we also have Cedar Crest High School students to Hershey High School, Thursday, February 9th, 2023, to Saturday, February 11th, 2023, for the student rehearsal competition and performance at PMEA District Band. We'll ask for your approval on those two overnights. And then for the use of facilities request, uh, we do have two. One is um, Sunday use of facilities. Our Falcon Youth Basketball Club would like to use the High School Gym A, Sunday, February the 5th, uh, from 12 to 6 for travel games. Um, we also have a uh, for-profit and Sunday use request from Champion Force Youth Cheer Program. They want to use Ebenezer on Sundays, February 5th through May the 21st, uh, 2023, from uh, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. for cheer classes. So we're going to ask for your approval next week for those. That's all I have. Okay. Questions about any of those items? Okay. And we're on to finance and business, and this is the time of the year where uh, Mrs. Hens will give an update, just very big just picture very update, brief update of our from budget. November, yes. Very early. Uh, but we have, we have a decision that we have to make in January, so that's why yes. we have to do this. All right, the first thing I want to just review is the timeline. Um, so tonight we're reviewing the budget estimates. I'm just going to give you updates of anything from November till now. And then I also provide a five-year projection that is also included in there. Um, for January 17th next week, um, we will uh, look at adopting the um, 
opt-out resolution to not exceed the Act I adjusted index for Cornwall Lebanon for the 23-24 budget. And then we are uh, able to, based on this timeline for this year, is uh, present a proposed final either April or May. So we do have a little bit of flexibility there. And then um, the, the June 19th date would be when we would approve the final budget. So any changes from that proposed final to the final is what would be approved. And then we would adopt it at that point in June. So that's the timeline. I go on to the, this is what I presented in November. Really there isn't um, any major changes. So uh, this is what was presented in November. Um, we will, work on this um, detail line by line um, until m April or May um, when we present the proposed final, but this is where we are right now with our estimates. Familiar with the, the pie chart that was presented earlier, um, but this is overall, as you can see, our most of our budget is made up of personnel. If you want to proceed to the next one, um, again, I can't say this enough. The challenges that we have are, are just like any other operation is um, major inflation with equipment and supplies, hiring um, of support staff and labor cost. Also continued uh, significant cost of third party cyber schools, which I'll go into a little detail later. And then also uh, special education costs. Those are things that we have to um, consider when we're looking at this budget. Two changes um, from the November presentation until now, PEASERS did uh, certify their rate at 34%. So for every dollar we pay in salary, we pay 34 cents um, to the state to cover PEASERS the um, school employee retirement system. And that's equivalent to about 14 million in the 23-24 budget. Third party cyber schools um, total, I had reported in November at 1.6. We're estimating right now based on updated invoices, 1.8 million for this school year. And that is uh, $550,000 more than what we had paid prior to the pandemic. So if you want to proceed to the next slide, it'll give you just um, estimates. Again, um, on the right-hand side is the 1920 amount that we paid is 1.2 million, and we are now estimated to pay the third-party cyber charter schools $1.8 million based on how many of our students in, that reside in, in Cornwall, Lebanon are going to cyber charter schools. Um, known facts with this budget, um, Cornwall Lebanon provides virtual options for our students and families, um, and uh, we continue to do that even after the pandemic. Maximum increase in the real estate tax within the index is 5.1%, um, would provide an additional revenue of 1.8 million, and we are planning on utilizing the assigned fund balance for retirement cost. Um, we're slowly whittling away at that. Um, but it would be 166000 this coming budget. Next slide. Um, what we don't know is pretty much what we don't know in January of every year is um, where we were going to be with uh, local revenues, state subsidies. We don't know um, how much we're going to get in basic ed or special education subsidies. As well as our federal subsidies, we only find that out in late May. Um, where we are with our federal or title programs. And then also healthcare costs, we're still watching those, um, and as well as special education costs, and we're not sure yet. So we have a little bit of time to work on this budget and put, put a proposal together for you for April or May. As of right now, I am recommending to do the opt-out resolution to not exceed the Act 1 index. Um, so that's why there is a Y under the resolution. Um, for the 23-24 fiscal year. So we will have the resolution on for next week to approve.
And there is a draft in your board docs now. This is a required decision point. We have to either have a preliminary budget or we have to, for right now, based on all these unknowns, which doesn't make sense, or pass the resolution to not exceed the index. And that's based on a timeline that is required that we have to follow. Yeah. So are there any questions about that? Obviously, as we know, more information that will be shared. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh. You have another have item one under One other here. item under finance and business is um, we, we need you to approve the mileage reimbursement rate of $65 per mile for the January 65 cents. <laughs> 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 it is a little high. Everybody not, started submitting mileage high. after that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is a little high. Um, I don't know if you remember last year when we approved this. Is it was at fifty eight cents, and then in uh, July they made an adjustment, so we had um, sixty three, sixty what was it sixty two cents approved, and now it's at sixty five cents per mile. Okay. <laughs> So we'll have that on for you to approve next week at 65 cents. <laughs> okay. okay. That'll be it. Are there any questions about those finance and business items that Ms. Hens presented? Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll go on to personnel. Dr. Bosman. Okay. For personnel. The first one is to accept the following retirements, resignations, and rescindments. Kimberly Ketty, English instructor, Cedar Crest High School, effective February 5th, 2023, or until released by the superintendent due to resignation. Kathleen Lilly, English as a second language instructor, Cedar Crest High School, effective at the conclusion of the 2022-2023 school year due to retirement. Todd Dumas, assistant wrestling coach, effective November 29th, 2022, due to resignation. Jenna Welgamuth, assistant boys volleyball coach, effective January 2nd, 2023, due to, or due to resignation. Juliana Hoke, flex nurse, RN, effective November 18th, 2022, due to resignation. Joan Light, school secretary to to assistant principals at Cedar Crest Middle School, effective December 7th, 2022, due to resignation. Dr. John Slagle, hearing officer, <clears throat> effective December 15th, 2022, due to resignation. Aliana Rosario, instructional assistant, special education, Cedar Crest High School, effective December 22nd, 2022, due to resignation. Brian Stoner, District Custodian, Cornwall Elementary School, effective January 6, 2023, due to resignation. And Patricia Gatos, Building Assistant, Cornwall Elementary School, effective at the conclusion of the 2022-2023 school year due to retirement. Next, approve the changes in employment status. Amelia Williams, from Primary Assistant to Instructional Assistant, Special Education, Cornwall Elementary School at an hourly wage of $15.25, effective November 30th, 2022. Next, approve or ratify the employment of the following personnel effective with the 2022-2023 school year pending completion of pre-employment materials. Bailey Penn Pennypacker, assistant wrestling coach, 50% at a salary of $2,223. Taylor Geeman, Assistant Wrestling Coach, 50% at a salary of $2,233. Jack Beasley, Assistant Baseball Coach, at a salary of $3,777. Jess Nolan, Assistant Softball Coach, at a salary of $3,777. Amanda Beekler, Assistant Softball Coach, at a salary of $3,777. Joseph Egert, Assistant Quiz Bowl Advisor, Cedar Crest High School, at a salary of $776, prorated. Rebecca Laser, Building Secretary, South Lebanon Elementary School, at an hourly wage of $14.54, effective December 19, 2022. 
Sonia Rodriguez, school secretary to assistant principal, Cedar Crest Middle School, at an hourly wage of $14.54. Christopher Horn, district grounds maintenance, at an hourly wage of $16.22, effective January 2nd, 2023. Randall Byers, district custodian, Cedar Crest High School, at an hourly wage of $14.25. Brandon Ober, district custodian, Cornwall Elementary School, at an hourly wage of $14.25. Michael Garrett, building assistant, Cedar Crest High School, at an hourly wage of $14.60. Effective December 16th, 2022. And finally, approve the following volunteer coaches Todd Dumas, wrestling, and Jenna Wolgamuth, boys volleyball. Okay, do we have any questions regarding personnel? Just a quick one How, how are we faring with our um, complement of custodial and maintenance workers? I see we have two to hire. Do we still have vacancies? That's been an area of challenge. I mean, okay. there, there's still been some, there's been some growth in that area, but still an area that we're looking to hire some folks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. We'll go to uh, the next item on here, which is policy and management. <clears throat> and we have... It, it looks like we have a lot here, but it's not as complicated as it, as it might appear to be. So we have a number of policies that were placed on the table, meaning they're placed on there for, for public review, and we put these on back in November. We did not have a board meeting. We had a, our board meeting and a reorganization meeting in December, as it typically falls, is not within 30 days of the November meeting. So these policies then sit on the table for public review for an extended period of time, and then we look at them in January. And that's the process we've typically followed just because of not having that 30 days for policy review. So with that, we've got a number of these policies. We've got policies related to personnel here, such as jury duty, where we have them for different categories of employees. We're combining those into one policy. This is a sort of a long-term process. We have a lot of policies like this, but to try to condense and make the policy, man policy manual more user-friendly. The next one we have up here is the, if you could click the next slide, this is for physical exams. This is when people are hired, again, combining the three policies for three different groups of employees into one. Uh, the next policy is for the same for HIV infection. This is a state code mandated policy, and this uh, codifies these into one policy as well. 314.2, which is the policy after this. There are no changes to this. This is the communicable diseases policy that is currently under operations. We're moving that to the employee's policy section because the parts of, that are relevant there seem to fit under the employee's section. So it's just a recategorization of that policy. And then attendance eligibility is the other one that was placed on the table. And that policy just is to codify some of the changes on the school code that allow for students to attend the Cornwall Lebanon School District. So those policies will be on for final adoption. Then we have some other top policies now that will be placed on a period of review until the February meeting. And these policies are, again, similarly with the family and medical leave, combining the three for the different classification of employees into the one under FMLA. And then under extracurriculars, our extracurricular policy is dated. Uh, we have some of these after-school activities that are operating for our elementary students, and the policy stipulates fourth grade, beginning in grade four. So this change would then capture that practice of what we're doing. Uh, the student complaint process <clears throat> is one where it's really a change in titles because we've had changes with the uh, with Dr. Long's title during her tenure here, Dr. Bosman's, uh, Dr. Rackley's, you know, for instance, we had a director of secondary education, now we have director of personnel and operations. Those are the changes, the title and job changes due to different responsibilities that are captured in that policy because it references the old job descriptions and job titles that we had here. 
And then the last item, so those are the policies. Are there any questions about any of those? Those are relatively simple policy items. There's a lot of them, but they're fairly simple. The next item that I have on here is the Cornwall Borough land lease. And I'm trying to think when we spoke about this, I think it was, I want to say that this was October, November, maybe it was November. We talked about the, the interest that Cornwall Borough had in leasing that part of the property that is down opposite north of Freeman Drive down at Cornwall Borough to do community enhancements to that property. So as part of this, the district would still retain ownership of the property. And we came up with a time frame here of a 25-year lease with, there are clauses that allow the district or the borough to, if, if it's, there's issues, we, can, we have ways that it can, it can be exited. But the idea here isn't to do that. The idea is to have this partnership to make long-term and lasting improvements that would benefit both the community as well as the district in the long term, and to look at grant funding for some of that property there. Uh, so again, the land would be used by the community. The district would still have access to this property during the school day. We would utilize this. We could utilize this for parking. Uh, Cornwall Borough is going to seek to make improvements. And we'll be able to look and talk about some of these improvements. They've talked about walking paths, ball field improvements that would be just enhancements for community use. There are some specific areas that will still be used by the district exclusively, and those are carved out in there. Uh, we have a community garden by one of our parent groups there. We have a volleyball area. We have a, a maintenance building. But we would. this is really viewed to be as a cooperative arrangement with Cornwall Borough. So we would have that on for recommendation for next week to approve that that lease. And do we have a map here? I don't know if we have the map up here or not. We do have them. Oh, we do. Here it is. This, this just shows the area that we're talking about. And if you look at the, the bottom side there, if you want to just move your cursor, you can see where the Cornwall School property is on the, very, on the very bottom. That's not highlighted right where Dr. Murray's moving that cursor right there. And then that goes up to past where the minor is there. Everybody can picture that because everybody knows how much fun the intersection is. So, so that area there is the district property, but the area in blue is also the area. So the area we're talking about for the lease is specifically that section up there. And of course, you can see where there's actually some of that wooded section along 419 that is also part of that. Questions, comments about that? Are there any plans to uh, uh, like clear the wooded area, or are they going to leave that? Any clearing of the wooded area would have to be approved. There are some things that if they were to put uh, walking paths or community things in there, there would be some partial, but the, the lease agreement calls out any of the uh, harvesting of lumber or things like that, that that would require district approval to okay. do that. But there could be some things that obviously with just putting in paths if they did things like that that would be normal as part of that. Right. But those would be benefits for the community too. Any other questions regarding that? Okay. Thank you. We'll go on to pupil services and technology. And Dr. Murray, I believe you have the first item here. Thank you, Dr. Demensic. So the first project that we have here is the technology services plan. Um, about a comprehensive plan and a half ago, they eliminated the section for a tech plan. Um, it, it's integrated and interwoven within other components of the comprehensive plan, but it didn't call for a specific technology plan. However, we saw the value in this to have a, a unified vision for technology to make sure that it's supporting our curriculum, supporting student learning, and operations throughout the district. So we continued with the plan, and we used a similar format. However, since this upcoming year, uh, last year it uh, expired, 
we really didn't have any restrictions on format or type or anything like that. So we basically took the old technology services plan and revised it from the ground up. And in doing so, we focused on three main things. Um, first is customer service, building a culture within the technology services team around our core values. Um, and the reason for that is if you notice that when different people leave organizations, goals, core values tend to shift and change. We want to make this team larger than any one person on it. So we're working and building off of the, the culture and the goals and the comprehensive plan. So it's very, very heavy in that respect. And this plan was developed through a lot of different studies. We looked at a lot of major corporations and different innovativeness. We looked at Apple and Microsoft, Disney, Amazon, uh, Google, all the big names to see what made them tick and see which good parts we can incorporate to improve our existing district. So that's where these came from. Aligning resources and plans, just making sure that everything coincides with what we're doing in the classroom. And this is already taking place. Uh, we've had numerous meetings since the break on software subscriptions. We've met about curriculum. We've talked about observations. The whole gamut, it's already started. We're meeting with principals, we're talking, we're having conversations. Communication has really picked up in the last week and a half. So we're really, really excited about that. And the other piece is documenting. So if someone were to leave, we don't lose that entity knowledge. It's all documented in one place, so the next person can just pick up the documentation and keep going. So the, the main quality standards that our, our tech uh, plan is based upon are safety, courtesy, support, and efficiency in, in that particular order. So of all things, safety is highest ranked. Um, we will go out of our way to make sure something is safe, um, even if we have to you know, have a classroom wait for a little bit before they have a specific technology. We need to make sure it's safe before we install anything. Um, so just different examples like that. Um, these are all broken down in the document that you found in uh, Board Docs. And this one just outlines some of the different goals. I apologize for the small print on that. But basically, we're re realigning, goal or realigning roles within the district tech team so that they correspond with what the district needs. Uh, Dr. Rackley uh, made some... Uh, kind of big announcements here with the science of reading, um, with steels. So we definitely need to have support for our classroom teachers, work on different types of instructional strategies. So we're really working on having those supports available for our teachers and rolling that out. Um, then again, like I mentioned, we, you know, improve the district communication. This is where we're making sure that everybody understands uh, what's being rolled out in technology why we're rolling it out, why the decision was made, and how it's going to affect the classroom and student learning. The other big one that's on here as well is updating our websites. Our websites are basically our virtual portal for anybody to understand and see what our district's about. Right now, we don't have a lot of time dedicated to our, our website because of just time and priority. So what we're doing is, like I mentioned, we're, we're shifting, we're realigning our roles within the tech team to meet the district needs. One of our major needs is a website improvement plan. So we're in the process of doing that to make it more active, to make sure the con content stays um, up to date. For one person to do this, it's, it's quite a daunting task. So we're realigning the roles so multiple people handle multiple places and make sure that everything's coordinated under Amy. Um, just make sure we have one voice for the one district. Um, so that's just a few of the goals that are out there. And again, just some of the other things that are mentioned. There are specific goals, like updating infrastructure, things like that. But again, we want to make sure that we're supporting the comprehensive plan. So that's, that's overall the, the uh, goal of the technology plan. Um, 
Any questions on specifics or other questions? Bringing vision to reality. Yes. This is an excellent <laughs> I looked at, I thought, 60 pages. Oh, really? But exactly. I tell you what. Excellent, <laughs> excellent work. Timing, super. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray. Thank you. And, and, and when we say vision coming to reality, that doesn't mean we're going to say yes to everything. Right. But sometimes we'll have to say no because of resources, funding, things like that. But we're going to say no in the nicest way possible. Then we're going to follow <laughs> up with alternatives that the district does support. And then we'll check in with you a couple of days later to make sure you're doing okay. So even though we can't say yes to everything, we're going to say no in the nicest way possible. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And, and the safety aspect, I have such confidence in all the safety things that you do. It, I mean, I have a school device, which I use, and I just feel like it is totally cy cyber safe. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. We have some bus and van drivers. Yeah, so um, you'll notice in the, there's an attachment there from Dr. Schaefer to approve the following drivers pending the completion of the required driver materials for Bright Bill Transportation, it's Gina E. Felty. For D.B. Fisher Transportation, it's James H. Adams, Jr., Amy Elizabeth Bonowitz, Sherry S. Livering, Vanessa Pizarro, Sasha Ramirez, and Joseph John Sheehan, Jr. So we do this during the year. As periodically, as there are drivers to be approved, we, the board, the district, does approve drivers that are hired by Bright Bill or Fisher Transportation. Okay, they'll be on next Monday. Yes, they will be on there. Okay. And then, Mrs. Hens, I think you have another item here. I do. <clears throat> so, we are looking at purchasing an additional district van. Um, currently, we do have three in our fleet. Uh, we, we did have three in our fleet. Um, we are anticipating uh, two to be delivered through that bid process that we had you approve, um, hopefully February, if it stays on track. And um, we would also like to add another one using CoStar's pricing um, to explain, expand our fleet to four. Um, this would be a full-size van like we have right now in our 2011. Uh, total cost is 48475 and we are asking for a ratification on Tuesday from you. Give us two full-size full and two, size, smaller, two vans, smaller vans, depending yes. upon the nature that kind of seems to work out better. We've had cases where, you know, two, three, four, five students, it's staff would, I'm sure, prefer to drive a smaller rather than drive one of the full-size vans, so, yeah, a lot easier to maneuver, so. Okay. Any questions about these items that we have here? Are there any questions from or any of our board directors about any of the items, the presentation, or anything that we talked about? this evening. Okay. Are there any questions from anyone in attendance about any of the items uh, that we've talked about this evening? Okay. Thank you for coming. Okay. Okay. Mr. Schlegel, that concludes our items to present to the board. Oh, yeah, Mr. Snyder, did you have any questions? Uh, Dr. Mensing, not right now at this moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. So he's with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone, for all the um, good information that you provided this evening. I will announce that we will have an executive meeting uh, for the purpose of legal matters at the conclusion um, of the meeting. So at this point, having nothing else on the agenda, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. And motion and a second to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>